Hey there. I thought I'd talk a little bit today about salves and flying ointments, which I use as ritual entheogens and quite enjoy making and having about. However, rather than giving you a detailed history, what I really want to do is talk about the practical end of things, how you make them, things to keep in mind when using them, and how I incorporate them into my practice. The earliest mention of flying ointments, by that name anyway, dates back about 550 years or so. And the earliest recipes include a collection of, by and large, poisonous plants with fairly rich and storied mythologies. About half of those plants are from the Solanacea family, which is the family that brought you belladonna and mandrake, which contain deliriant hallucinogens in the form of tropane alkaloids, like scopolamine and atropine. And because of the mythological associations of these plants and the historical romance associated with their use, a lot of people who are interested in flying ointments will seek out these old recipes, sometimes in the hopes of replicating them. Which, in general, I would suggest is a terrible idea. If you have not made or used salves, psychotropic salves, or flying ointments before. For one thing, these old recipes that you'll find aren't necessarily historically accurate, and you'll note a distinct lack of measurements, so they don't give you a really good sense of just how much of whatever was in there one is supposed to include. But these stories also convey the users losing consciousness sometimes for a very long period of time because some of these tropane alkaloids will do that and death isn't exactly out of the question. There's a reason why scopolamine is one of the least abused drugs. Tripping on scopolamine is generally not considered a pleasant experience. The internet is rife with examples of people who have tried it and come away from the experience absolutely dedicated to the notion of never doing it again. Which is not to say that I think that there is no place for, for instance, a mandrake flying ointment. I have made that myself. I've used that myself. But I think all of this is a very good argument for knowing what you're doing. If you're going to work with plants and herbs that are potentially deadly, you cannot stick to mystical reading material. This is one of those times in your practice where really and truly texts on pharmacology and medicine are a good idea. Even though, as many of you may be aware, transdermal absorption of the psychoactive components from many of these deadly plants is safer than ingesting it, which is, I think, a major perk and a major draw of using salves. But you are, of course, not limited to using particularly dangerous plants in a salve. Flying ointments essentially got their name from the intense near-death tripping that people experienced as a result of coming close to overdosing on tropane alkaloids. But you can absolutely make wonderful salves with much safer plants with wonderful properties that can be an incredibly fantastic addition to your practice. And in using much safer plants, the application of these salves themselves can be a wonderful tactile experience because you wouldn't need to be nearly as concerned about how much you're using, where you're putting it. But before going over the details of how I make my salves, I'm going to chat a little bit about some of the things that are important to know if you are interested in working with the more toxic end of the floral family. So first off, if you are not familiar with the terms effective dose and LD50, you need to be, and you need to know the difference between them. Because the difference between the effective dose, which is the amount of a compound at which you notice physiological or psychological effects, and the LD50, which is the dose at which 50% of organisms or people exposed to those compounds die, well, that's, that's an important chunk of space. That is the space occupied by people who are still alive, by and large. Maximal safe dose will fall between those, and beyond that is the point where people start experiencing adverse effects. 
different compounds, different plants vary in how far apart from a dosage standpoint the effective dose is from the maximal safe dose to the LD50. Magic mushrooms, for instance, are famous for the extremely wide divide between the point at which people get high from ingesting them and the point at which they're dangerous. And by magic mushrooms, I'm talking about really specifically psilocybin. And when I say the point at which they're dangerous, I mean the point at which people experience toxicity and death as a result of the psilocybin rather than some other allergic or negative reaction to the compound. The distance between effective dose and maximal safe dose for many of the solanaceas is much, much narrower. And these numbers are important when you're dosing your salve, when you're trying to determine, very roughly by the way, because making a salve at home using plants that have individual variation from one mandrake cutting to another, for instance, in how much atropine or scopolamine they contain. At the very least, by knowing the effective dose in the LD50s, you will begin to get a sense of where you are most likely to be safe. The second thing I'd like to add is that I think it is both distinctly imprudent and, frankly, less spiritually beneficial to begin by making a salve that is a combination of many of these plants, particularly if you've never worked with any of them before. Just as if you're into stones, crystals, you probably don't get to know them by just dumping a handful into a bag and hanging out with that bag full of rocks. Spending time with individual plants will give you a much better sense of the feel of those plants, those identities, those correspondences, what the plants mean to you, what energies, ideas are encapsulated by those plants. From a safety standpoint, it's worth keeping in mind as well that these plants are themselves cocktails of compounds. And should you happen to have any adverse reactions to a salve containing a half dozen different plants, well then you'll have no idea whatsoever which of those things may be influencing you negatively. And having a negative or an allergic reaction to some of these plants isn't exactly outside the realm of possibility. If you suffer hay fever, for instance, ingesting mugwort in teas or transdermally can kick your allergies into gear. Unfortunately, regardless of how you approach it, if you're using slightly toxic plants, there will be inherent risk. Because even when you do your research very responsibly and well, you won't necessarily know how it really applies to you. When you find the LD50 for a compound, for instance, well, that number almost certainly came from studies using rats or mice, rodents. And you may think that rodents would be more delicate than we are when it comes to drug effects, but in fact, it's often the opposite. In many cases, they're much more resilient and can tolerate much higher doses than a human of equivalent size could. Secondly, most of those rodents will have been male. Female physiology interacts differently with a number of compounds, and interactions can vary based on hormonal state. And so even if you know all of the details of the toxicity of these compounds, it's really important that when applying it to yourself or somebody else, you're always massively lowballing the estimate of risk. If the LD50 is 25 milligrams per kilogram, have it, and you'll start to get close maybe to what it's more likely to be in people. Are you female? Have it again. Now let's say you've done all your research and you're feeling really confident and you want to make a salve with a mildly toxic plant that may have some psychoactive properties. Okay, great, now you have a salve and you don't really know what the concentration of that salve is. Well, at this point, the only way to find out is to essentially dose test on yourself. Create a rough and personalized dose response curve, which means starting off by applying a very, very, very small amount and seeing what happens. And then after 45 minutes an hour, adding another very, very small amount and seeing what happens again. But here's the thing. Transdermal absorption depends on more than just the amount of salve you're applying. Where you put it is crucial. Your inclination may be to rub a psychoactive salve over your third eye, but surprise, 
there's some pretty strong evidence suggesting that absorption of these compounds through skin on the forehead is actually pretty rapid and pretty high compared to other parts of your body. The surface area that you cover with the same amount of salve, so if you take a little bit of salve and rub it over a quarter sized area versus spreading that over the entirety of your forearm, well, the larger surface area is actually going to increase the amount that you end up absorbing and the speed with which you absorb it. So when you're talking about something that's toxic, dosing isn't just a matter of how much you use, but where you use it and over what area you're using it. Finally, there are some plants that appear in these classic flying ointment recipes and that perhaps some people do use that I would never because they're scary. Some things are to be looked at and not touched as far as I'm concerned. Monk's hood, for instance, is one of them. Water hemlock is another. And genuinely, unless you have an advanced degree in pharmacology, and I don't mean you minored at it in college, it is quite simply unlikely to be worth the risk of tangling with these plants. As a final note, before getting down to the recipe that I use, the information I'm providing you here is only the very, 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 very tip of the iceberg. And before involving yourself with anything dangerous, it's absolutely crucial that you get proper advice from proper research and that you not be reckless with your own safety. Now, the general recipe for a salve is incredibly simple. A salve is essentially a lipid carrier, so a fat, into which you infuse a plant and then firm up with some beeswax. Now different fats are more or less efficient at penetrating the skin. One of the classics that is used is pork fat, which you would render in order to get a nice white lard. But you can, of course, use various vegetable fats, oils. In general, when using safe plants, because obviously the amount of plant material you use is going to depend on how dangerous it is, what the concentration of toxins in those plants are, the measurements I use are essentially 15 grams or half an ounce of a dried herb or plant to half a cup of fat. And I'm fortunate enough to actually have a sous vide machine, which is a carefully temperature controlled water bath in my kitchen. And so I will incubate the herbs in that fat at about 140 degrees Fahrenheit for several hours, occasionally stirring. You wanna be careful not to bring up the temperature too, too high. And you can, of course, incubate herbs in a fat that remains liquid at room temperature, at room temperature, but you would have to do that over a much longer period of time. Heating speeds up the process. If you don't have a sous vide machine, which is likely, do not use a pressure cooker. It's not the same kind of thing, but you can use a double boiler. Put an uncovered mason jar into an oven set to a very low temperature, or even just fill your sink with hot water and put the jar containing the oil, fat, and herb in there. Keeping in mind that in order to keep the temperature elevated, you'd have to switch out the water pretty regularly, which isn't terribly efficient and which you may find a little wasteful. In general, I will incubate herbs for at least six hours at about 140 degrees. I have also thereafter removed them and left them to sit for a couple days at room temperature. You can, of course, at any point in this process, incorporate them in ritual, charge the infusing herbs in moonlight, sunlight, storm, whatever speaks to you, whatever it is you're trying to do or achieve. And once your herbs are properly infused, or rather once the fat is properly infused with all the goodies from the plant matter, I then simply strain that hot fat through a few layers of cheesecloth in order to separate out all the solids. At this point, give those a good squeeze to really get all of the fat out. And keep in mind that the volume may have reduced which is to say that as you strain out the herb solids, you want to remeasure the volume of the now infused fat that remains. Now, one thing worth noting is if you're using a water bath or a sous vide machine, you don't want the container to be sealed per se. You don't want to screw on the top of your glass container. Do not use plastic, obviously. But you do want to 
place a lid on top, cover the top, so that excess moisture doesn't work its way in. Once you've separated out the herbs, it's time now to bring that fat up to about 147 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, because this is about the melting point of beeswax. Now you do not want to massively overshoot this temperature though, so a thermometer is a good thing to have. At this point, I add about half a teaspoon of pure vitamin E oil to help stabilize everything. It'll extend the shelf life. And then add about 15 grams of beeswax, which you have to stir in very well. Once all the components are incorporated, you can then remove the fat from the heat and pour it quickly into the tins you're using. The beeswax will make it firm up pretty quickly, so you want to work fairly fast. And then once everything is poured out, you can just leave it to solidify at room temperature and set. Now in general, I keep any tins that I'm using currently at room temperature around my altar space. You can extend the life of these ointments, easily keep them for a couple years if you chuck them in the fridge. And of course, it's important to carefully label yourselves so that you know which one is which. And once I get to know particular salves, particular plants, I do tend to dedicate salves to particular purposes, in much the same way that I like to associate particular scents to a task. For all my doom and gloom and danger lecturing at the beginning of this video, I do really enjoy working with salves and flying ointments. But in general, my preference is to work with compounds that are a little bit safer. Salves are incredibly easy to make, but one of those things that feels really good to do, and that offers a great deal of opportunity to incorporate ritual and charging at different steps in the process because it's something that takes several hours or even several days or weeks to do. So if you have a favorite herb that you work with, I do encourage you to give it a shot in salve form. And until next time, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day.